Snarking at books by moonlight, writing trashy romance by daylight, Labby Dragon lives in the theater at the edge of space, an unstable anomaly of science and magic. And you, dear viewers, have just entered her realm. Hello, and welcome to Let's Read with Labby Dragon, because I love ludicrous premises. Five kids from the Orlando area are chosen to record footage that will become a new attraction in the Magic Kingdom. Daylight Holograms, known as the Disney Hosts Interactive. Months after the DHIs are implemented, the kids start waking up in Disney World when they sleep, as their holograms. And under the guidance of an old, enigmatic Imagineer, discover that belief has allowed the Disney villains to gain power not only in the magic side of the park, but in the real world as well. Unable to stop themselves from crossing over into the parks at night, the kids are thrust full-on into battling classic Disney evil. If that sounds at all interesting to you, I can assure you that stopping this video right now and buying this book will be well worth your time and money. Not because it's a literary masterpiece, but because it is fun. All caps. It has everything you'd want in a guilty pleasure young adult novel. It's cheesy, sometimes predictable, but full on a good time. Actually, it's kind of like Kingdom Hearts without the Final Fantasy characters and world hopping. Before we get into Kingdom Keepers, I need to mention that the author is Ridley Pearson, who co-wrote Peter and the Starcatchers with Dave Barry. They've worked together on more than Peter and the Starcatchers, but all I've read is Peter and the Starcatchers, which I must say is fantastic. When I found that out, it greatly increased my expectations for the book, from expecting it to be laughably bad to expecting it to have merit, and it does indeed have merit. However, in my opinion, this book is much weaker and makes me think that perhaps Pearson and Barry complement each other so well, it's harder for them to be as good apart. Which, of course, is not a negative thing. Right away, you realize that the first portion of this book is pretty much going to drag along at a snail's pace in something trying to resemble mystery intention, which wouldn't feel so slow if most of the information wasn't already revealed in the blurb on the back of the book. Our lead character, Finn Whitman, appears in the park by himself and meets with an old Imagineer, Wayne, who goes on to serve as the kid's mentor but not the particularly helpful kind of mentor. Wayne is really more of an exposition guy than a real mentor. For the most part, he throws the kids to the wolves, because this is one of those kinds of books where only children are imaginative enough to take on the task, though for an actual reason. So what we find out is that Finn and the other four children were selected to become DHIs because they were chosen for a super secret after hours mission by Wayne and some of the other Imagineers. It's a big conspiracy. And Finn realizes that while he's in the park, he is his hologram in some kind of science fantasy unexplained... You know what? It's gotta be magic. There's magic in the rest of the book, so it's not hard to assume it's actually more magic than science. Finn also finds out that he and the other DHIs are the only ones who can see the characters come to life at night in the park when he sees several of the good guys walk by and Wayne can't even sense them at all. Which brings me to my singular biggest question about Kingdom Keepers. Nah, I don't question the pseudoscience. I don't question the conspiracy theories. My problem is that, despite having established that the good characters are brought to life by children's beliefs as well as the villains, the good guys never do anything. I mean, if Maleficent is powerful enough to leave the parks and be there during the day, then how come the prince never shows up? He killed her once, he could be helpful. I don't know, maybe it happens later in the series. So Wayne tells Finn he's not going to explain everything until he tracks down all the other DHIs and gets them all to fall asleep at exactly the same time. 
When really, if they all end up in the parks when they sleep and they all go to school in Orlando, they should theoretically be able to meet up purely on coincidence instead of Finn skipping school and running around the Orlando area, sneaking into other schools and badgering people, trying to find four kids he only knows by face and one name. But still, what Wayne demands, Wayne gets. So Finn goes to school the next day and spends a lot of time in memory mode so that we can get a lockdown on what the Disney hosts interactive attraction is. It's a replacement for real people as tour guides. And we get a basic archetype sketch of each of the DHIs. They were chosen to be a spread of diversity, so of course the first thing that sticks out is where they fit in that. I'm just going to point them out on the cover. Maybach is the one who's the most paranoid about the whole DHI thing right off the bat. But really, I have no idea why. And he's also the computer guy. Charlene is the girlier of the two girls, and an obvious potential love interest for Finn. The middle one is Finn himself, and then comes Philby, who's kind of nerdy. And then there's Willa, who's pretty level-headed and... does stuff. Honestly, they're all pretty well fleshed out by the end of the book, so it's hard to say any one of them really fills only one role. They share interests with each other in various combinations, so they frequently end up working in teams in really sensical patterns. Oh, and just because this is hilarious, this exchange happened between Finn, Maybeck, and Philby during a break in the filming for the DHI attraction. Philby continued, this has never been done before. DHIs? Not like this. We're going to be turned into absolutely perfect three-dimensional images. Duplicates of ourselves. We'll look real, but we'll be made of nothing but light. It's pretty cool technology, actually. But if it's never been done before, Finn said, how do we know it's safe? Finn, cameras don't work that way. Okay, well... Technically, they do become magically linked to their DHIs, but they had no reason to think that could happen at all, and I still say that's not science. It's clearly magic. At school, Finn talks to his sadly soon pushed to the wayside best friend, Dillard. Oh boy, this kid's parents dropped the ball on naming him. Now, obviously, Finn has a hard time convincing him that he was in the Magic Kingdom last night as his hologram self, and... Who wouldn't think he'd gone crazy? And this is why Dillard really can't play a big role. He's so detached from the action that he kind of just bumbles in and out of scenes when it's convenient for Finn to have him around. I actually feel bad for the kid because to his knowledge, his best friend is having serious mental problems and keeps leaving him to hang out with his DHI friends. At the same time, we get introduced to what I like to refer to as Side Plot Amanda. I'll get into it more later, but the book spends an inordinate amount of time developing this character, and I kind of hate her. Right now, what you need to know is that her parents work at MGM, because this book was published in 2005 before it became Hollywood Studios, and Finn plans to involve her in the stupidest plan ever. So Finn decides that the best way to track down the other DHIs is to take a picture of their holograms in the parks. Problem is, because he is a DHI himself, Finn only gets to go to the parks if his mom gets it pre-approved by whatever crew handles the DHIs and goes in disguise so that there aren't two of him in the park. Now this is pretty reasonable, and if he breaks these rules, he's subject to removal of perks and possibly other issues. No problem, right? He tells his mom he really wants to ride Splash Mountain, and they all head out, and he happens to take some pictures of the DHIs. Or he sends one of his other friends to do it. Or he even just picks up all of the available promotional material about the DHIs. There has to be promotional material, because something as big, a breakthrough as daylight holograms would be freaking just everywhere. So, which perfectly reasonable conclusion does Finn come to? He gets Amanda to get two comp tickets from her parents and sneaks into the parks in disguise, all while trying not to really tell her why he even wants pictures of the DHIs. This, of course, leads to Finn being chased through the park by security, 
and at one point stealing from a gift shop the outfit his DHI is wearing to pose as his DHI while his real DHI is right across Main Street, USA. Thanks for ruining the magic, asshole. By the way, his DHI is dressed in purple and green, kind of like Barney. Honestly, I get that the author is trying to cram in as many get chased through Disney scenes as possible to kind of point out where he did his homework, but making your lead character put himself in this kind of a dumb situation doesn't really endear him to people. Okay, okay, I'm not really in the target audience, and maybe the target audience doesn't think about it the way I do, and they just think, oh man, this Finn kid is so awesome for getting away from the undercover security at Disney. I wish I could do cool stuff like that. Or maybe even the kids who do think like me just stuck with it because they were desperate to see the premise actually develop into something like I was. After all of this tomfoolery, Finn takes Amanda and hops a shuttle bus to the former MGM Studios to bother the project lead, Brad, which he maybe could have done before risking himself in the Magic Kingdom, for some information, which Brad legally cannot give him. But Brad does freak out when Finn mentions the Overseers, that is, the term Wayne used to describe all Disney villains and evil possessed animatronics. This also totally clues Amanda into the fact that something serious is going down, but Finn goes all nope face on her while she begs for more information. However, as it turns out, name dropping the overseers totally goaded Brad into breaking any confidentiality clause they had in the DHI contracts, and Finn gets a message left for him in his school office with the names of four middle schools from the area on it. So, blah blah blah, Amanda follows Finn all around Orlando as they stalk the crap out of the other DHIs, during which Finn gets asked if he was on Zoom, which is another unfortunately outdated reference as Zoom has been off the air for a while now. Which is sad, because I have so much nostalgia for Zoom. This happens at the school where he finds Charlene, who gets described like this. Charlene was the kind of girl you might see on a cereal box. Uh... Just what brand of cereal are we even talking about? I just... How does that make sense to anyone? So that night in the park, before anyone else shows up, Wayne explains to Finn that there are some places in the park where the DHIs don't show up. Though really, there seem to be fewer of these places than you would think. And then, some of the animatronic pirates from the Pirates of the Caribbean ride show up pushing around cars from the Buzz Lightyear ride for dubious reasons. At which point, Wayne mentions that Phantasmic's animatronic dragon malfunctioned and actually set Mickey on fire. But guys, let's be real here. If any of the Phantasmic dragons are going to malfunction that hard, it would certainly be California's, which is a bit infamous for needing repairs. What? I'm a Disney freak. I read about things. And then Charlene and Philby show up just in time for the pirates to come over and start trying to push them around. In another strange turn of magic, the lasers on the Buzz Lightyear cars turn into real lasers. And also we find out that the kids can be hurt while they're crossed over into their DHIs. So they skirmish and Finn ends up having a nice little laser duel. Wayne's all like, Good job, but there are only three of you, so I'm going to bugger off now. But the kids turn on him pretty quick, threatening not to sleep if he doesn't try to explain at least some of this to them, considering animatronics just burned a spot on Finn's arm with what should have been harmless light. I've already talked about a lot of what he mentions, but then there's this. A hurricane changed course while out at sea and then headed directly here to Orlando. I'll accept that as a coincidence, a fluke of nature. Wayne, clearly growing agitated, collected himself. Do you know what happened to the storm after it passed over here? Check it on the internet. It lost power. Yes, that would be normal for a hurricane in the middle of a landmass to lose power. They gain power over the water and weaken over land. That is how hurricanes work. 
For whatever reason, though, Wayne is convinced that this hurricane was harnessed. Something about having more things get messed up than usual. Honestly, though, that has got to be one of the most hilarious moments in this book. And now all the kids are going to be terrified every time a hurricane passes over Orlando and weakens. Oh, and since we're on the subject of crazy things Wayne says to the kids... There's a fine line between imagination and reality. An inventor dreams something up, and pretty soon it's there on the table before him. A science fiction writer envisions another world, and then some space probe finds it. Can I just ask you, Wayne, are you referring simply to the discovery that other Earth-like planets exist? Because as far as I know, we have not definitively discovered a world literally out of a science fiction novel. And if they were real, are real, if the hero and heroine go off to live happily ever after, then what happens to the villains, witches, sea monsters, and evil stepmothers? Well, according to Disney, which we are crediting with spreading the belief in these characters, most of the villains are either outright dead or effectively entrapped forever by the time the good guys have their happily ever after. It's why they can have a happily ever after. And they all still live in the same area in New Fantasyland, which makes me just think that Belle leans out of the window of her home every morning and yells across at Gaston to stop being evil. Which again brings me back to the idea that if the way the characters exist in the park has such a huge effect on people believing in the villains still holding power, then they should also believe that the heroes and heroines exist in a similar, not quite post-happily-ever-after state. Then again, I am applying way too much logic to a book about a made-up Disney conspiracy. Anyway, when Finn wakes up after the skirmish with the animatronic pirates, he finds out that his arm is still injured in the same place it was on his DHI. He rushes to the bathroom to take care of this pea-sized laser burn and wakes up the whole damn house by squealing about the pain. Leading us to think one of two things. Either Finn has a very low pain tolerance, or he's not quite savvy enough to stuff the shirt he's just taken off into his mouth and bite down while cleaning the wound instead of screaming and basically begging his parents to come find out he's injured. Which is exactly what happens. In a complete disregard for bathroom privacy, Finn's mom just busts right on in, leaving Finn to spin a very bad lie and just generally get his mom really upset. Blah, 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 more stuff with Amanda. They find Maybeck and they all meet up in the virtual magic kingdom. Okay, let's just take one second for a brief history lesson that I stumbled onto entirely from reading about the virtual magic kingdom in this book. I had never once heard of VMK, so while I thought it was probably real, I had to check. Well, as it turns out, this is another reference to a now dead property. VMK was a casual hangout with minigames kind of MMO that opened in 2005 as part of the Happiest Celebration on Earth campaign. In 2005, I was probably obsessed with Gaia Online at the time, and I lived in a household that still had dial-up internet, so I probably never would have gotten VMK to work for me anyway. Along with the minigames, VMK had customizable rooms which you won decorations for, mostly with points from the games and such, and could be used like chat rooms. Since this book is set during the early days of VMK, it gets played up as all the rage, and the kids frequently use it for their communication, instead of some AOL instant messenger like those Animorphs had to use back in the 90s. For a while, there were even tie-in promotions inside the Disney parks. Quests you could complete IRL during your Disney trip, or items you could buy that came with virtual codes. Virtual Magic Kingdom was shut down in 2008, with the URL now directing to the game section of Disney.com. I didn't find exactly why Disney chose not to continue on with the VMK promotion, but I didn't look that hard for it. However, it seems the game had a bit of a cult following that still loved the game and miss it. My guess would be that Disney no longer found it very profitable, as the site required constant real-time moderation in order to protect the target demographic of young children and the Disney family-friendly name. But hey, now we have Connect Disneyland Adventures, so you can still walk around in a digital Disney. 
Yeah, not the same thing at all. I had a joke about VMK, but I gave you knowledge instead. I do have to point out, though, that I just showed you what VMK looked like. Amanda here is very impressed with the graphics, apparently, declaring how she feels like she's in the room. Make of that what you will. The kids all show up in Disney World at the same time, finally, so Wayne is all ready to reveal some secrets, but not before he takes them through a literal Escher room in a scene that takes enough time for you to first marvel at the depiction of backstage Disney, which may or may not be accurate, and then start to realize that the DHIs are being projected into places they would never normally go. And exactly how much money it would cost to put the projection systems in this area for no reason. How did the Imagineers get this crap past corporate? On the way through this Escher room, Wayne drops an important hint that the way the DHIs interact with the world has a lot to do with perception and belief. Then they end up in an elevator, which takes them to an apartment inside of Cinderella's castle. Which, okay, aside from the way they got there isn't too hard to believe, since there is a honeymoon suite in the castle as well. This room is supposedly a fabled secret hideout of Waltz. This is where Wayne finally drops the exposition on the kids. He tells them a fairy tale, originally known as the Stonecutter, but referred to by Walt Disney as the Stonecutter's Quill. This story is basically the equivalent of the Constitution in National Treasure. Oh yeah. This book is one part Kingdom Hearts, one part National Treasure. So Wayne basically sets the kids off to go look for the clues in the park that the fable is leading them to. And then he hits a button and literally falls through the floor as if to say, your problem now, sure hope you can save the world, peace out! The next night, as they meet up at an appointed shadow area where their holograms are not projected as an attempt at secrecy, Maybeck decides to wave his arm in and out of the projection zone, which would totally clue off any overseers in the area that there was something going on. At this point in the book, I didn't really like this kid. For a moment, Finn questions why Walt left all these clues in Disney World and not Disneyland, but it kind of gets rationalized away by Willa. But he had dozens of loyal people working for him. His brother, his nephew, he could have passed his wishes along to any one of them. Philby added, And Wayne worked here, in Disney World. Walt told the fable to Wayne, and no one else. Another thing Kingdom Keepers has in common with Kingdom Hearts is Maleficent as a boss-level enemy. So, of course, that is exactly who shows up during the kids' little powwow in the teepees. Did I mention that they crammed five kids into a fake teepee? No? Well, they did. But they stay real quiet and she just goes away again. Nothing exciting. I mean, this moment is supposed to be the big reveal of the main villain of the novel. But the thing is, I already knew that when Wayne made a big deal out of malfunctioning dragon form Maleficent from Fantasmic. I mean, you could not have foreshadowed that more heavy-handedly. I got the feeling we were supposed to pick up on that, but I'm not sure. So the DHIs are all set to meet up in Waking Life at the Fall Games, but first Amanda needs to whine at Finn about how he doesn't tell her anything and they don't hang out enough or whatever. I don't get the impression they were close before Finn came to her about getting the photos, but now that they have established a friendship, she is on Finn like glue. And okay, she has her reasons. But she still comes across kind of annoying, and honestly, the person I still feel bad for in this situation is Dillard, who was really close to Finn before all of this happened. And then Finn stumbles into yet another little crush. Poor kid is really struggling with adolescent hormone surges, it seems. Here's how this one introduces herself to him. Hey, Finn, she said as if they knew each other. He stopped. Hey. I'm Jez. That's an unusual name. Short for Jezebel? It's from the Bible. Yeah, okay, hun. Let's not hit Finn over the head with your role in the story, okay? He still won't get it. What I find funny is that Finn still only fears that they are in danger at this point, 
considering he is the one who sustained the most physical damage already. You would think he'd be pretty sure of just how much danger they're in. So they've got their plan. Finn just has to convince his parents to let him go to bed at 8. Yeah, they still think he's sneaking out, so they're being pretty hard on him for suddenly wanting to go to bed really early all the time. And just when he does get into bed and is trying to sleep, Jez shows up at the door. And Finn's mom just lets her in. So instead of telling his mother that he did not tell this girl where he lives and that she is obviously stalking him, Finn just lets his mom be kind of dithery over the fact that a cute girl has come to see Finn and she forces him to talk to her even though he has come downstairs in a robe over what she should assume to be his pajamas. And then Amanda shows up. Finn's mom is way too happy about the number of girls who have shown up at 8 p.m. to see her son uninvited. Of course, only after things have become absolutely crackers does Finn end up playing ill to get back to bed. Oh man, Finn, if only you were a little bit quicker on the uptake, then this side plot wouldn't have needed to be here. Really. Finally, the thing we all came here for starts. They get on It's a Small World at Night to look for a clue that has to do with the sun, and since the huge Mayan sun on the ride is the biggest in the park, that's where they're headed. However, as they go through the ride, Willis starts realizing something unsettling. Willa pointed, Hey, did that doll move? she asked. Maybeck said, They're all moving, girl. They're singing. No, I mean moving, as in... Walking. Maybeck laughed. The others followed, even Willa, who was glad for the chance to release the tension they were all feeling. Okay, so Maybeck wasn't there during the whole POTC incident, but maybe Finn, Charlene, and Philby, who were there, told the story of when Finn was physically injured by a possessed animatronic. Laughing is not the reaction anyone should be having right now. And then comes this, this strange moment where the narrator is no longer narrating from a third-person point of view limited to what the children experience because it starts to describe the small world dolls going demonic behind them. The sudden jump to a fully omniscient narrator as opposed to how most of the book is at the very least limited to the children's experience so that we as readers can experience the story with them is a little jarring if you're the kind of person who catches that kind of thing. For one paragraph, I was thrown into a movie scene. It's a very filmic tool to allow characters to walk out of frame and then focus in on the horror behind them. And it's not that it can't work in a book, it's just that in this instance it hadn't been established before now, and we're already halfway through the book, so it's really jarring. That aside, yes, It's a Small World is in fact full of evil in this book, as the dolls start attacking our heroes. Finn sustains perhaps his most embarrassing injury as one of the dolls bites him, but you'll never believe how they get out of this one. Willa and Charlene start singing along with the ride's theme, and then... then... well this. And a smile means friendship to everyone. Smile. The sun had brought them here. The sun is often shown with a smile on its face. Friendship, Finn thought. It's all about friendship, Flynn declared. The lyrics, our ability to spread friendship like the rays of the sun. You know, the phrase, spread friendship like the rays of the sun, would be much less hilarious coming from colored full ponies. Add friendship is magic to the list of things this book will remind you of, despite the fact that it predates F.I.M. But it works, of course. This is a Disney World story, after all. However, they failed to find the clue they were looking for. Not that they actually knew what they were looking for, so alas, they have been ankle-bitten by rabid dolls in vain. So Finn goes to this Girl Scout car wash Jez begged him to go to. And as an adult reading this book, I am way creeped out by how overtly Jez is flaunting it. But then 
then we get to the plot again when Amanda says something that sets off a house moment for Finn. Only it doesn't come to fruition until after they spot a car parked near the car wash. Look closely. Tell me what you see. Finn turned his back on the car completely now. Okay. A woman. A grown-up. Her hands on the wheel. White gloves, Amanda supplied. That's a little weird. A little? Yeah, white gloves are a little weird, even for Florida. Like, totally insane, Finn observed. It's a zillion degrees out. Oh. My God. Let me tell you folks a thing. Just because it is hot in Florida doesn't mean people don't sometimes wear fancy clothing. Honestly. You don't know this woman. You don't know her life. She could be a really classy lady who never goes out without gloves on. Maybe she just likes them and doesn't give a shit what temperature it is outside. Maybe they're made of a lighter material than you think because you are too far away to tell, nor do I have confidence in your ability to identify fabrics, Finn. Ugh. This shit just makes me so mad. Not to mention the ha ha, Florida is crazy joke. That shit is so old. Just get some new material. 